All right, now we're looking, uh, finishing up chapter 14 today. Last time we looked at the first part of chapter 14, which is a continuation of the visions we've had since that seventh trumpet. We're still in that interlude. We haven't even gotten to uh, the final judgments and plagues. It's, it's sort of a revision, a review of all of human history in a sense from this um, allegory, however you wanna frame it, of the, the woman and the dragon and the male child and the beasts and the 144,000 and Michael and the angels and sort of a spiritual history of the world. So back in chapter 12, we had that great sign in heaven, the woman, and again, the, the devil, that dragon pursuing the woman um, and seeking to capture her. She gives birth to the son who is of course Christ who rules all the nations and he rises and then he takes, after he's thrown out of heaven, takes his vengeance by going after the offspring of the woman, which we are clearly told are whom? The end of chapter 14. Who were the offspring of the woman? Believers. Yeah. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. And hopefully that would be us as well. So we are brought into this. And this is not some drama happening in some galaxy far away. It's right here. We are those offspring of the woman who are belong to Christ, who are the object of the dragon's fury. But he doesn't attack us directly. He's a spiritual being. And so he calls forth his beasts to do the work for him. We had the first beast that came out of the sea. And what did we say that beast represented? If you can remember. Evil, darkness. It is evil and darkness, but a particular kind. I thought that was the first one was Satan, wasn't it? Well, the dragon is Satan. The right. dragon is the devil. And then he calls the, the beast comes out of the sea. Okay. Is the physical manifestation of the dragon. Um, but if you remember, he's described as he resembles a leopard, a bear, a lion. And uh, if you remember that, what that all meant, it, it's a reference back to Daniel uh, chapter seven. What's the meaning of the beast, of that first beast? False prophet. That's the second beast, the false prophet. Well, it, it, yeah, you're asking for a specific individual we said it was? No, not a specific individual, but just in, in, a, in a general sense. When Daniel yeah. talks about the beasts in Daniel yeah. 7, who does he mean? Well, he, he's talking about the, the, those kingdoms that have historically opposed the, God's people. Yeah, the kingdoms, the powers of this world opposed to God's people, the persecuting oppressive powers of the world that are in opposition to God. So they're inspired by the dragon to persecute and to do harm. And so that would be in Daniel's day, it was the, the Babylonians would have fulfilled, they were described as a lion uh, devouring the prey uh, or after the Babylonians, the Persians mm -hmm. described as a bear. Um, the, the after them the Greeks described as a leopard and then finally the Romans described as a terrifying beast that without description and that's of course the beast that John is dealing with but it's not limited to those particular ones as if we don't have to deal with the beast because the Roman Empire has been destroyed the beast is alive and well today and where do you see the beast today oh, Ukraine <laughs> <laughs> Taiwan. Ukraine right now in in and in, in hoping to invade Taiwan there's the beast um even inside our own country inside Iran, our own country. Yep. Iran and Iran uh, North, yep. North uh, Korea it's China. all over the place Russia yeah and so there's some the there, there are all sorts of beasts roaming the world every time there is a government power which is almost in every country uh, that is opposing and hostile towards God's people, toward Christ and his church, uh, there's the beast manifest. So it's not this, that's why I like the way John describes him in, as, a, as, a, as a mixture of all these different beasts, leopard, bear, lion, to give you the sense, this is not, we're not talking about one particular group that once you get rid of them, you're good to go. Um, this is continually. Back in the 40s, the beasts were very powerful. In, uh, in, in the Soviet Union, in Japan, in Germany, um, in, Italy. in China, in Italy, right? Very powerful. 
and they're always in opposition to God's holy people. And so that this calls for patience, endurance, expect the trouble. So if, if God is ordained, you're going to go into captivity. Guess what? Go. You're going into captivity. If God is ordained that you're going to be killed with the sword, you will be killed with the sword. Uh, and so be patient, endurance, and faithfulness. Um, and then a second beast arises coming out of the earth. This one also is referred to as the false prophet. What was his role in this? He's different from the first beast, but what's his role? To build up the first one. Yeah, he calls attention to the first one. He uses religion and spirituality and, uh, and worship and directs it toward that first beast, calling people to worship the first beast. And John, which, uh, go ahead. What you're saying right there is just amazing in terms of what I saw on the web today. Medvedev, who is the number one dude after Putin, uh, was given a big uh, uh, religious speech today saying that that is the reason for their actions and pointing to Putin as being righteous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They do that all the time. They, 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 they yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, they do this all the time. They get, uh, yeah. it becomes a religion. You guys... You guys need to mute yourself. Yeah. I got him. Um, so they, um, yeah, they, they constantly, they pervert religion and they get the churches or any particular kind of religion to, um, to support them, endorse them. And you're going to see that even in our country where it's become a, a religion. Uh, it's become some of the, the politics has become there are churches in town that if you go to their churches their sermons are political every single sunday mm -hmm. you know and it's typically the, the platform of the democrat party and mm -hmm. week after week you're going to see it's it's a, that's the message it's not christ um now in other parts of the country you might find other political sermons that are more uh more conservative in nature but these are this is the kind of perversion of religion used to prop up uh, mm -hmm. political powers and in john's time it was the imperial cult they had uh cults calling for the worship of the caesars um and you can see they were certainly bankrolled by the empire as well so this calls for endurance and he tells them to calculate the number of the beast and that number the 666 we talked about that before um exactly what that means uh, I can tell you for sure it's not a literal number uh, that is marked on people's hands and heads because it's in contrast to the mark of the lamb, the name that is put on the foreheads of God's people, which we know is not a literal mark, but a sign of their, that God owns them. And so the 666, there were a couple, there's several options people consider. And frankly, I just, it's, it's not that important. But uh, it could be uh, the number of the name of someone at that time, like a Nero that John had in mind. It could be that he meant it symbolically, like the number six is the number of man, and that's the, the end of it. So you're not supposed to worry about who exactly it is. Um, or, you know, some, some believe that it will refer to somebody in the future. Um, though I, I tend to shy away from that interpretation because John is telling his readers right there in that time to, to calculate the number for themselves. They would have understood what he meant. So if there was somebody specific, I think it was somebody at that time. But that's, again, nothing to fight over, uh, just some very different takes on it. So, all right, that was last time, last few weeks. Chapter 14, we got 144,000. Uh, these 144,000, where are they right now? Uh, they oh. were, they're not on earth. They're around the throne. They're oh. around the throne. Oh. So that 144,000 is a complete number of God's people, 12 by 12,000. And that these are around the throne. And we know that he describes them as the first fruits to God. They're, they've been offered as first fruits to God. What does that mean? They were sacrificed uh, in God's name. Yes, they were sacrificed. They were martyred. These are the ones, if you remember, when the souls under the altar crying out, those who've been killed for Christ, they cry to how long? And he says, 
uh, wait a little longer until the full number of those who are to be killed are, are brought in. And so this now is looking forward now to that full number. They've been brought in now and they've been presented as these sacrifices to God following the lamb, which is following in his on the road to Calvary. So. All right, then we have the three angels. Let's go through those one more time here. Let's read that section, just a quick review of the three angels, and then we'll get to our passage today. So, um, um, Bob Thomas, would you mind reading that for us? Uh, verses 6 down to 13. Okay. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who lived on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory, because the hour of judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of the water. A second angel followed and said, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in its image and, re and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest to there will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patience, endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to jesus okay great so three angels come and they each give a message from heaven uh to mankind the first message is what fear, fear god, god and give him glory yeah fear god give him glory worship him who made the heavens and the earth right the hour of judgment has come so get right with him the second angel says what fallen is babylon <laughs> Fallen is Babylon. So Babylon the Great, there's the great powers here. The, another, another way to reference the beast here is fallen. The devil's kingdom has fallen now. It's over. And then the third angel makes an announcement. What happens to those who've worshipped the beast, who are so, part of Babylon? The, uh, wrath, of God. The wrath of God, God's fury. Yeah, God's fury, they are about to drink the wrath of God now. <clears throat> Judgment has come, and this calls for endurance on the part of the people of God. And we talked about that before, is you're going to, we're going to suffer. We're going to have trouble. You pick which one you want here. Uh, fear God, give him glory, worship him, repent, be forgiven. But then you'll be numbered among the 144,000 who were rejected and, and, and suffered in this world. But that's the wiser course because Babylon has fallen and all who belong to her will be tormented forever. This is a terrifying scene of God's judgment. So now we pick it up our passage today. Um, verse 13. Just, just look at verse 13 here for a second. Uh, Rob Roy, would you read that for us? Just 13. <clears throat> then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Okay. So now he hears a voice from heaven. Uh, we've heard a voice from heaven before. Um, I did notice uh, something interesting. Uh, the voice from heaven is, I'm wondering now, if this is kind of a reference to Matthew 3.17, where when Jesus is baptized, it says, a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. You know, could this be the voice of the father speaking? Uh, if not the vo direct voice of the father, certainly someone speaking for the father. But John uses that term also in 10 verse 4, when the seven thunders spoke, uh, as he's about to write, I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up 
what they have said, do not write it down. Um, and then 11, 12, a voice from heaven speaks, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on, speaking to the two witnesses. But what's interesting is in chapter 10, that voice from heaven tells John to do what? Write this down. Do not write it down. Do not write it down. Seal it oh, up. Oh, sorry. Uh, but then what we just read, this voice from heaven in chapter 14 says, um, write this, which is interesting. So back in chapter 10, the voice is calling forth something that is not to be publicly announced just yet, mm. but now it is. Now there's write this down. Mm -hmm. And what is the statement? And when he says write this, that's another phrase he uses. Um, what do you think he means when he says write this? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Record it. Record it, okay. Um, so other people can hear it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, in chapter 19, verse 9, he says, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. And then 21.5, he uses again that phrase, write this. I'm making everything new. Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. So that it seems like that giving them the command to write this down is to emphasize the significance, the importance of it. This, these are trustworthy and true words I'm giving you right now, uh, turning it into scripture here for him. So back to 14. So, so in 10, four, when he says, don't write it down, is that a judgment? So let's go back to 10. That's a great question. Uh, 10 is uh, the angel and the little scroll. And then it's, uh, he's holding a little scroll and he gave a loud shout. And when the seventh thunder spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Um, so he says, there will be, who created the heavens and soar by him, there'll be no more delay. The mystery of God will be accomplished when the seventh trumpet is sounded. Sounds so, like the silent treatment is serving as a judgment. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That, that's a classic scene where God, you see that in the gospels where Jesus, sometimes Jesus tells them, um, I'll give you an example of, uh, in the gospel of Luke when Jesus heals Jairus's daughter. If you remember that scene, Jairus, that, that ruler of the synagogue begs Jesus to come, my daughter's dying. His daughter dies and Jesus is approaching and all the people are outside weeping and wailing. And Jesus says, don't weep, she's not dead, she's asleep. And all the people laugh at him, they do not believe. And he goes in there with just <laughs> Jairus and his wife, and three of his disciples, and he raises her up from the dead, and then he tells them, do not tell anyone. Mm -hmm. And he, he specifically says that, really, so for, for everybody out there, their only conclusion is not that God has visited them, but that, oh, we must have made a mistake. The girl was, I guess the girl was just sleeping. Mm -hmm. And so because of their unbelief, he hides his glory from them. He will not let them hear. And how many times did Jesus tell people, don't say anything? Don't tell mm -hmm. anybody, right? Mm -hmm. It was an act of judgment to, um, when it, it really, it's the silent treatment. God stopped speaking to us is the first thing. And so there's no, um, that's why, by the way, when Jonah was commanded to go to Nineveh, and his message was 40 days and the Lord is going to destroy this place. Mm -hmm. Jonah was upset about that because he knew that if I have to go deliver a message to Nineveh, it means there's hope for them, mm -hmm. that God hasn't completely judged them. Because if God had completely judged them, he would do what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah and just burn it up. He wouldn't, he wouldn't send a preacher to them. He wouldn't speak to them, but he does. Um, so at this point, I think you're right. This is, a, this is a, that particular scene. I'm going to judge it, but now we get to 14, 
And the message that he's right down is not a word of judgment, is it? Mm. What's the message that he's right down? Someone's blessed. <laughs> yeah. Who is blessed? Blessed are the dead who blessed. die in the Lord. Yeah, the dead who die in the Lord from now on. What does that mean, the dead who die in the Lord? The martyrs. 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 But just people that believe in him, that accept him as their God, and and they pass on if they stay faithful to him yeah yeah i think the blessed are the dead who die in the lord who are faithful to death to the lord and uh they are blessed and and how are they blessed so if this is the father speaking the spirit responds and says yes how are they blessed they may rest from labors for their deeds yeah. follow them they will rest from their labors for their deeds will follow them so to rest from their labors, that kind of reminds you of uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, where Jesus says, come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And the Sabbath rest of Hebrews 4 that they're given, um, their deeds will follow them. That's an interesting phrase. Is that works? There, there is a reference to their works. Um, what kind of works are we talking about here? Revelation 19. Eight is another time I think it's used. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. So I want to talk a little bit about that. What are the deeds of that follow the believer, that the, the one who dies in the Lord? They keep his commandments and they have their faith in him. Yeah. Yeah. There are, you know, you remember in James where he talks about faith and works mm -hmm. and faith without works is dead. Yeah. So what's really interesting about James is that he gives Abraham as an example of faith and works. Mm -hmm. And what was the work that James says that Abraham did that uh, was, that verified his faith? He believed. Yeah. He believed and left the country. Went where yeah. God he started. He started to sacrifice his son. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was going to sacrifice his son. So by works, by deeds, that doesn't seem like a good deed. <laughs> to me. Um, it's the. But he deed did what God asked him to do. Exactly he had faith right. Faith in God. Exactly right. So there are deeds that come from faith. But then yeah. God sacrificed his son. Exactly right. Yeah. And so, the, so Abraham did that prove that he really believed what God was saying. You know, the, the proof is in the pudding, right? The, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. It, those, those are not just, is it, he's not saying that their deeds are the things that, that save them, that they did enough good deeds and therefore they get to go to heaven. But their deeds were the deeds that came from faith that proved they really believed. The, uh, you know, you, 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 you put that James passage together with the, pat, with the order of Genesis, and it's enormously important because in Genesis 15, it says Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then in chapter 17, two chapters later, he circumcised. So that can't be the reason for his salvation. Yeah. And then in chapter 22, way down the road comes Isaac, this, you know, sacrifice and so that way after it says he believed god and yeah. was credited to his righteousness yeah and every step of the way his deeds were always confirming his faith he just right he went with what the lord had revealed to him he believed you know the that that's really important to get so you know you you looking at someone let's say you're a boss and you have an employee and and you, this one employee says, I just love this company so much. I just love you. I love this company so much. How do you know that he's being sincere? By that his work. Being, yeah. Work ethics. You see his work ethic. And I can see that. I can see not just that he's on time, that he works hard, but the way that he works, that the, the joy I see in him as he does his job, I can tell that he doesn't even need to tell me that he loves the company. I can tell that he does. As opposed to the other who says, oh, yeah, I love this company or but then he sleeps in half the time, uh -huh. up, has a bad attitude. It's like, you know, I'm having a hard time believing that um, the, the deeds follow. 
I think that's a good phrase. The deeds follow them. They don't establish them. They don't make them worthy. They just prove that they really believe they were in the Lord uh, by their deeds. And Jesus says that too, doesn't he say it? By your fruits, you'll know them. I like when you did that, the, the American gospel, when they talked about the root and the fruit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are good words. Yeah, excellent, you know. All right, let's take a look at the next paragraph here. Uh, Liz, would you get this for us here, 14 to 16? Sure. Um, I looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a, man, a son of man with the crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud, <clears throat> clouds swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Okay. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold in his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Any guesses of who that is that's seated on a cloud here? Jesus. Yeah, that's the Lord, right? It's like yeah. Sunday school, right? It's, it's always the answer to Jesus, yeah. right? Yeah. So let's, let's do... Um, that's so a reference. Know, what, why is an angel telling Jesus what to do? Oh, the angel is... Uh, another angel came out of the temple and called an alarm. Um, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. That's not a, that's not a command of like, I'm your boss kind of a thing, but it's almost like a, uh, a general going up to the commander, like the, the president and saying, right, now, right. now's the time, give the orders to attack, you know, kind of a thing. So, um, you know, he's, he's letting him know this angel, we're going to get to him in a second, um, that uh, he says it's time now. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll explain in just a minute how that angel knows that it's time. Well, he but, doesn't say that the one on the cloud is an angel. No, the one like on the cloud is clearly Christ because he's described one like a son of man. And angels are messengers, so he's bringing a message. Yes. Yes, the angels carry the messages. And the angel could be carrying a message from the father to the son as well, however it's framed. But the son of man is a reference to Daniel 7, which has a different, it's good to know this passage because there's a different, it's an interesting um, comparison between the two. So let's look at Daniel 7. Um, Daniel has this vision and chapter 7 verses... Um, 13. 13 and 14. Um, Jack, would you get that for us? In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancients of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. All right. You'll notice that same phrase, one like a son of man. That's exactly the phrase that John uses. And he mentions a cloud, too. But there's a little difference in Daniel 7 versus Revelation 14 regarding the cloud. What does it say here regarding the clouds? So he's coming with the clouds. So he's coming with the clouds. He's approaching. So this is a heavenly scene. This is not Jesus, the son of man, coming to earth on clouds. It's he's coming with the clouds of heaven, approaching the ancient of days on the throne. So this is a heavenly scene here. In Revelation 14, what's the, do you remember what it was that was said about the son of man regarding the cloud? It was on the cloud. It was a dark cloud, wasn't it? Yeah, he's in Revelation. So in this one, he's coming on the clouds. These are, these are clouds of judgment here. He's coming in power. In Daniel's, in, in Revelation 14, it's different. First off, what kind of cloud is it? White. It's a white cloud. And what is he doing? Is he coming on the clouds? He's sitting. He's sitting <laughs> on the cloud. Does that matter? Yeah, it's a position of judgment. Yeah, 
in, in this case, however, in this case, what's interesting, he has a crown of gold on his head. The word crown, do you remember there were two words for crown? Mm -hmm. okay. Diadem. Uh, Diadem. The diadem, diadem. Crown, which was the crown of authority, and, and then there was the Stephanus crown, which is the crown of victory. This crown, I don't know if you have a guess what it is. I would say it's a diadem. The, the, the I could have sworn it was a diadem, but it's not. Uh -huh. It's the crown of victory in this one. It's the okay. Stephanus he wears. Uh, it's the same word used to describe the crown of thorns that was put on Christ's head. They made a crown of thorns, a Stephanos of, of thorns for him. Here he's seated in victory on a white cloud. And now he has a sharp sickle in his hand, ready to, uh, ready to reap now. But what he's going to do, his reaping, you're getting a sense, is, um, is not necessarily, is it a judgment reaping here? I think it will be in a second, but this there are two reapings going on here. The, fir the first one is is the people that are being saved. Yeah. So the first he takes his sickle and he swings it over the earth and harvests the earth. And he this is a reference to one of the parables where he reaps the harvest and he brings the wheat into his barn. And then he sends away the, the chaff. There's going to be another sickle going to be hitting, which is going to be the one of wrath. But this first one is basically kind of follows the blessed of the dead who die in the Lord. They rest from their labor. That he's sitting on a white cloud. There's not this ominous coming in clouds, but he's sitting on a white cloud. And that he has a crown of gold, of victory. So he's kind of gathering in his people. It seems to be the focus of this one. And the other part, too, is the angel that came out of the temple. What a strange place for an angel to come out of. Mm. Um, do you, this is a, so this messenger comes out of the temple. Do you, do you know, have any clue why that's important, the coming out of the temple? It's God's residence. It is God's residence. It's a reference back to Revelation 6. Where were the souls of those who had been killed? Under the altar. Oh. Under the altar in the temple. They were there under the altar. So he's coming out of the temple and crying out, take your sickle and the time to reap has come. Implying all those who were to die in the Lord, who were to be martyred, are complete. It's now time. He's giving, he's passing on the message here. You know, we, we've counted them up. They're all there now. They're all safely there under the altar. It's time for you to reap the harvest. And so he seats him, kind of swings a sickle over the earth, and the earth is harvested, implying that his, his people are in every nation all over the earth. Um, so this first part is, is more positive scene. It's the second one that's pretty troubling. Let's take a look at that one. Um, Teresa, would you read this for us? Uh, 17 to 20. Sure. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth and gathered its grapes and threw them into the great press of God's wrath. They were trampled in the wine press outside the city and blood flooded outside of the wine press as rising as high as the horses, bridles for a distance of 1600 stadia. Yeah. All right. Well, you notice it's another sickle. Who's wielding this one? An angel. An angel. An angel, another angel. It's, a, it's not the son of man. The son of man, will the first one, gathered his people to himself. The sec, this, this is an angel that comes out of the temple now, and he has another harvest to do. Um, it's not like the first one. Um, some things in how the angel is described. Verse 18, 
what do we know? What does he say about the angel in verse 18? He's in charge, charge of the fire. fire. He had Thank charge of the know. fire. What does that mean? He had charge of the fire. What's the significance of fire? Judgment. 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 Right? Punishment. Pretty much every time you see fire, it's it's judgment. It's um, and so he sat, he is the in a sense the angel of death, the angel of judgment. Um, I guess if they were to, I think that's probably where they get the Grim Reaper from. No. Angel of death, right? Comes with his sickle. Uh, takes his sharp sickle and but this is not a harvest of of wheat but it's a specific kind of um, harvest that he's gathering what right. he's gathering. i wonder why they use grapes because you would think that clusters of grapes are what they want to harvest not what yeah. they want to dispose of Except for, I guess, when you're making wine. Yeah. <laughs> and what do you do with the grapes when you make wine? You crush them. You crush them. Right. And where do you, how do you crush them? Stomp on them. Stomp on them. Underneath your feet. Does that ring a bell to you? Mm -hmm. This, this, you, you, you just, you just uh, illuminated some aviation understanding, Pastor. How's that? Well, uh, to a fighter pilot who, who sees another airplane that is obviously inferior to his. That guy, that other airplane is always referred to as a great. It's just <laughs> a great. And I never knew where that came from. Interesting. He's a great. He's a great. <laughs> ah. he's, cru he's crushed under my feet. He's under your he's feet, inferior. right? The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. He says of the, you know, of, from the very beginning, the, the son of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. You know, you'll bruise his heel. He will. He will bruise your head. This so, is that scene here. Yeah. So everything that has happened up until now, we could clearly see how that was relevant to that time. Is this also? I mean, this didn't happen in their time, did it? Uh, no. The final judgment. You know, it's so when when John writes these things to them. Um, he's speaking about events that are present and soon coming to them, right? But, but it's like looking at a mountain range. When you see mountains from a distance, um, some of the really big ones in the background, they look close. You don't know that they are, you know, 100 miles away from yeah. where you're standing, you know? So some of, the, some of the events that John sees are right there for them. Others are in the future distance and John has no idea how far off they are. This one here, as he's starting to get into scenes, but again, don't take Revelation chronologically. He's gonna keep circling back yeah. to themes. And this is, this is, I think, a clear reference to um, God's judgment, but also God has done this judgment scene a number of times, hasn't he? Mm -hmm where in the days of Noah, where he takes his sickle and he reaps Noah and his family. And then he takes his sickle and wipes away all of humanity. He does it in the days of Noah, where he, of, of Lot, where he takes his sickle and reaps Lot and his daughters and takes his other sickle and destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. He does it again during the Babylonians where he takes through, in, through exile, he takes the faithful Jews out of Jerusalem and then he sends in the Babylonians to wipe them all out and send them to captivity. So there are smaller scenes of judgment. It's a pattern. And ultimately, it will be fulfilled in the final judgment. Um, so, yeah, I, I would think and I think I think we get a lot more out of it when we think thematically than than chronologically and in, in a time space continuum. Yeah, but, it was just this was the first one that, that I couldn't connect to having already happened, but what yeah. you just explained about these other times, okay, yeah, it has happened. Now, in that time, by the way, I, I would say this, there is, you know, that what happened in Jerusalem and this whole, which is really interesting, this, this, the wine, the blood flowing out of the press as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of 1600 stadia. 1600 stadia is 184 miles. So they describe it in such graphic terms that you see a little a fulfillment of this in 70 AD when 
um, I think I may have mentioned before, when Jesus gives the warning about the destruction of the temple, he tells his disciples, these are the signs you're going to look for, that the, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, get out of there, flee to the hills. And they did. They, we have historical records of the Christians fleeing Jerusalem right before it fell. And they fled to a place called Pella, where they were gathered and saved. Um, and then the Romans came in and wiped it out and blood was pouring out of the temple. So many perished. I think I talked about that before. So that was another kind of a fulfillment at that time of something like this. But it is, ultimately, it's always pointing to that final judgment that will certainly come. Um, but let's take a look at what it looks like. So this, the grapes of wrath, that's where you get that song, right? And he's treading out the, what is it? Uh, the glory, glory, hallelujah, the battle hymn of the Republic, because this verse yes. of grapes of wrath are stored. Um, I can't remember the verse. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody knows it, you're welcome to sing it at this time. But, um, take your sharp sickle, gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. And let's take a look at that. The um, clusters from the vine of the earth. We're going to take a look at Deuteronomy 32. I have a reference to that. Um, here, let's see what that says. Okay, and he's speaking to a corrupt and warped generation and warning them of what is to come. Let me see if I can find it here. And we get down to here. I think it's 15 or so. Uh, let's give that a try. 15. Um, where is it here? Let's go from 15 down further here. Um, you realize see. that you're using NIV on your screen in the note from EV. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to. Good catch. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I was about well, to. I, didn't, I read along the notes and they weren't matching up completely. <laughs> uh, that's helpful. Thank you for catching that. I appreciate that. So um, there we go. All right. Jeshuan grew fat. Let's pick it up from first 15. I'm going to keep going down. There's a section here, I think, that gets into the um, grapes. Oh, here we go. 32. Yeah, around 32. Let's pick it up verse 28 down to 33. And uh, Elizabeth, would you get that for us? For they are the nation void of counsel, and there is no understanding in them. If they were wise, they would understand this. They would discern their late latter end. How could one have chased a thousand and two and have put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had given them up? For their rock is not our rock. Our enemies are by themselves. For they are vine, for their vine comes from the vine of Sodom and from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of poison. Their clusters are bitter. And 33. Their wine is the poison of serpents and the cruel venom of ass. He's re Moses is reflecting in this song on the Israelites' conquest of the Canaanites, these wicked people that were under God's judgment. And he's letting them know, he says, how, is it, how do you think it's possible that just one of you could chase a thousand of them and that, uh, that uh, two could have put 10,000 to flight? He says, because your rock was with you. He'd given them up to you. They were under his judgment. He describes their vine as the vine of Sodom and of Gomorrah and their grapes of poison and their clusters are bitter. And so they use that wine to reference their wickedness, their evil. And then it's also, it's crushed and turns in later on, it's wine is often used of the wine of God's wrath. Let's look at Joel 3, 12 to 13 is another passage. Speaking of grapes and wine and this kind of a 3, 12, and 13. Let's see here. Uh, Raymond, would you, would you get this for us? Uh, this is Joel 3, 12, and 13. Let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. But there I will set to judge all the surrounding nations. Put to the end the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go and tread 
for the vine presses full. The vats overflow for the evil is great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Put in your sickle. Time. They're evil. That evil, those those grapes that are described, that poison of uh, that these these are now there's harvest is full and they are to be gathered up and put in the wine press of God's wrath. This adds so much clarity to what Jesus means when he says, uh, if it's possible, Father, take this cup from me. If you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he has, he has to, he's been given a cup to drink. And what is the cup that he's given to drink? The wrath. A cup of wrath, right? Cup of the wine of God's fury against the sins of man. So the sinful men, this, our sins are described like grapes that are crushed. The only thing you can do with them is make, crush them to make wine out of it. And that wine is the fury of God's wrath. And Jesus says, I have to drink this cup for my people. Um, it's, a, it's a powerful scene. And the whole thing of the, the constant description of the treading down, their, their tread under their feet. Let's look back at Revelation 14. So we have the, the two judgments, the gathering of the, of the harvest into the barns and by the son of man, and then the angel coming, the angel of death, who has the order, who is the angel of judgment, comes in, gathers the nations and throws them into the great wine press of the wrath of God, where they're, and the wine press was trodden outside the city. All right, that's another question. Outside the city. All right. What is the meaning of that? Why is the, the, the wine trust trodden outside the city? Well, Jesus was killed, uh, crucified outside of the temple. Yes. Why was Jesus crucified outside the city? Because they didn't want to be putrefied by him. Yeah. So the way, the way that they have, um, they did things is that you know, the, the people, when they camped in the wilderness, God dwelled among them. And so anything unclean had to be taken outside the camp. And so they had, if they're going to use the bathroom, if they're going to have buried dead bodies, they're going to throw their trash. It has to be taken outside because the Lord walks among them. And so they're cast outside the city where they are burned. And that's what it was like. And hell is described that way as a trash heap. Remember when Jesus says, um, you know, these, these are cast out into the, out of darkness where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Mm -hmm. He describes hell as basically a trash heap outside the city where it's the fire keeps going and burning. And so the wine press is outside the city. The blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1600 stadia all right what that's interesting high as a horse's bridle that's an interesting phrase yeah he could have said how high is a horse's bridle by the way anyone know three four feet. five feet six feet five feet six feet right i say typically up to about your nose okay so i mean it's interesting he could have said you know it was as High as an elephant's eye. You could have said it's as high as a grain of corn. And he uses this phrase, a horse's bridle. So I did a little quick word search on that. This is how it doesn't take a lot to do it, especially if you're using Bible Gateway. So I just did horse and bridle and just see anything of interest come up with that. And lo and behold, there are two other verses that reference horse and a bridle. And one is Psalm 32, 9. Um, let's see. Uh, Bob Fowler, would you read that for us? Can you see it? Okay. okay. Uh, Psalm 32, is that what you want? 32, 9. Mm -hmm. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Okay. And then if you'd also read Proverbs 26, 3. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. All right. So what's the, why, what do you think? I mean, I don't know. I can't get in John's head, but 
when he mentions a horse's bridle, what's the what's sort of the purpose of a of a horse's bridle? What's that about? Control, control or bring under submission. Yeah, it's a forced submission, isn't it? Mm. It's it's, it's a, don't be like the horse or the mule, you know, who don't want to go this way and must be forced to. Uh, and the same thing, a whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. The fools need a rod to the back because they don't do what they're supposed to do. And so they have to be forced to do these things. And so this scene, it's kind of interesting that he uses that simple phrase to remind us of who these people are that are falling, who are being put in this wine press, who are being, who are under judgment. What kind of people are these? Fools. Don't obey. Yeah, the fools, the obstinate, the rebellious, uh, the ones who will not bow the knee to the Son of Man, um, and they must be forced to. So it could be, he might just, again, I, I take him, there's so many ways you can say something, and that he chooses that analogy, I think, I think has a little significance to it. Um, but it's just a, just a simple reminder of what we're dealing with here. But it's a it's a lot of blood, isn't it? Mm. Um, either way. So 1600 stadia, 184 miles. This is a river of blood, which should remind us of something else. Where have we seen Denial. rivers of blood before? Yeah, right. Wasn't that the first judgment against Egypt, the turning the river, the Nile River to blood? Um, this is God. They were under God's judgment. You're thinking of Pharaoh here and, and his obstinance. 1600 though any any guesses on what that could possibly mean 1600 it's not 1600 pennsylvania avenue just so you know <laughs> this does not reference our white house but what what is the number 1600 what do you suppose it could mean here all of the world four corners of the earth yeah how do you get that jack well, um, just because it's a um, four four times four hundred. Remember, remember the hundred forty four thousand. What is that? What? How does that number come to us? Twelve times twelve hundred. Twelve times twelve thousand. Thousand is the hundred forty four thousand. Here, I think you're absolutely right. It's four times four hundred, and four times four hundred, or forty times forty. Either way, you're dealing with four is the number of the world, the four corners. You're absolutely right. This is the judgment of the world. Uh, and no one is left out. The, the point that it's 1600 stadia is not a literal measurement. Uh, the point is that this is a full and complete judgment of the world. There is no one escaping this. And just the amount of blood should let you know that this is, uh, there are no escapees here. So when the when the sickle is, when the angel comes with this sickle, um, it's over. It is over. Interesting. The, the NASB just says two hundred miles. Huh. Two hundred miles. Yeah. yeah. Then, but you know, so, but the sixteen hundred stadia allows you to do say what you just said. Yeah, and I think that's why they do a disservice by by modernizing the the terms. I get it, and that would be helpful if it was if John was actually there with a with a measuring tape. To do it but that's not the point of it the point is the, the number is symbolic um absolutely right and even the 40 where else have you seen 40 and 40 in a day of judgment 40 days of flood yeah 40 days 40 nights i think that was 40 days in a desert yeah 40 uh, jesus, days for the ascension mm -hmm. jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days he was yeah. in the wilderness of 40 days yeah and and the israelites in the wilderness of 40 years and that, that's a completeness, uh, but it's a completeness that is in regards to the whole world, all the nations from every direction. And many, uh, of the so, kings, many of the kings ruled for 40 years. Yes, that's true. That's true. The first three kings are recorded as 40 years. Uh, Saul, David, and Solomon are each that long. So, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a significant number. It's not something to... And again, any number in Revelation is symbolic. It is not literal. It's not to be read literally as it is symbolically, uh, these numbers. Um, 
he is, this is, this is not a, uh, a detailed account uh, with exact measurements. It's these numbers carry weight to them. So we'll go with that. All right. So that concludes our uh, chapter 14. Any comments or questions on that? I hope. Uh... I was just um, questioning when you were talking about the, um, um, the cup of wine, the cup, the cup of grapes and stuff, and, and just trying to figure out how it fits with um, Jesus's last supper and, and, you know, the cup of his blood. Yeah. Um, is that just using two different symbols for two different things, or I mean, the same symbol for two different things, or no? I think there, there is a um, the com the commonality of it is when he says, "My blood shed right for the forgiveness of sins." So that's right. That the shedding of blood was this is the wrath of God, the the judgment of God against us oh, that man. Jesus oh. bears for for us in our place. Oh, so he yes. drinks the wine, the cup that God has given to him to drink for us. And, and that is the drink, judgment cup. So that he drinks that for us and it's his blood that's shed. Mm -hmm. And you see that, I mean, really it, this, this scene of the shedding of blood, again, it's not even that blood being shed is not a literal thing. It's mm -hmm. the, it's a powerful image of God's judgment and the death, the wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And uh, you really see that there. So, yeah. Thank you, Pastor Michael. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's take a quick peek here. What's coming up next? We have the seven angels. We're finally going to get to the next thing. The seven plagues are going to be coming to us next. So uh, yeah. that pretty much concludes the visions that, that interlude between. So we have the seven seals and then flowing into the seven trumpets. And then we have the second interlude here. And now we're gonna get into the seven plagues, the bowls of God's wrath being poured out. So it's gonna get awfully messy. I was just uh, gonna say, so now things are gonna get bad. Yeah, you thought it was bad now before, right? <laughs> it's, it's gonna get a lot worse here, so. Pastor uh, Michael, did you send out the tape from last week? Yeah, we watched it last night. Is that from yeah, we watched? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, I should have. So I know where I feel like I'm we're missing one, and I can't. And if you if you are subscribers to that site, and it, it'll let you know when a new one's up there. They're all on the same playlist on uh, preaching through Second Peter. Uh, I kind of put them all there for now. At some point, I'm going to organize them better, but they're all on that um, on that particular playlist on YouTube. You can find them. So all thank right. you. Recording. <laughs>